Good Brews, Bad Views, the podcast that usually asks if great beer makes bad movies any better, but we have escaped the confines of Ryan's basement and are at <laughs> Gen Con. <laughs> so, changing things up today, we are talking with Shane Ivey and uh, Scott Glancy of Arc Dream Publishing, uh, talking about bad movies and funny board games and such like that. So This, this is Shane, and, and I would like to clarify, to, to give uh, credit where it's due, Scott Glancy is Pagan Publishing. So we are sort of uh, long-time brothers-in-arms uh, publishing companies. In, Sorry about and, that. And we and we in share the... we share space at uh, at Gen Con every year and and uh, for for you know for all intents and purposes, but but it is officially its own company with a much longer pedigree than mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, at this point, uh, Pagan Publishing, my my position is, is like being the. Uh, the last legionnaire alive in Fort Zinderhoof. Okay. Um, <laughs> no. Perhaps the fort had a, a glorious past, but we've been picked off by Berbers and uh, uh, Tuaregs over the last couple of years. So we're, I've been promoted from uh, Private Glancy of the Legion to, uh, I guess, Marshal. Uh, <laughs> as long as that banner is still, that, that standard is still out. As long as the pagan flag flies high. Uh, okay, apparently we're still in the game. All right, so uh, even though we're not doing a normal format, we have our three standard questions for first-time guests of the podcast. So, Shane and Scott, um, what's the first movie you can remember seeing in theaters? Oh, boy. Um, the, so, the first one, this is, this, I guarantee you this is not the first one I saw in theaters. The first one I saw in theaters might have been some Disney, like, reissue, mm-hmm. like, 101 Dalmatians or something. I don't know. They used, what Disney used to do is every seven years, I think, they would, uh, if that's all right, Rachel, yeah, every seven years, uh, I'm talking to my wife, Rachel, who's in the background, facilitating. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but uh, before home video, um, they would re-release their clap those mm-hmm. movies out of their vault every seven years. So you could actually, I could actually go back in theory and say, what was the Disney movie most likely to be out when I was three or four? Or mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> The one that made the the, the the one that made the earliest biggest impression on me was uh, okay. So I think there would be two. The first was probably uh, the Robin Hood Disney movie. Yeah, I don't, uh, yeah, I don't remember what year that was. It was probably seventy six, seventy seven, um, and uh, and then of course, uh, uh, which you know, I, I was a kid. I absolutely adored it, um, and and. And it's turned out, I always, I always kind of assumed that I was weird about this, so I would never talk about it out loud, but it turns out I wasn't the only one of my generation that had a huge crush on Maid Mary and the animal, you know, <laughs> yeah. something about that. And, mm-hmm. and it worked the other way, like, uh, like half the girls that I've talked to about that and heard more about that really had a huge crush on the uh, animal Robin Hood, too. So. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, about it's the a way thing. you drew those, those, thing. those, uh, those boxes. Well, I, don't know, <laughs> I don't know how that Star Wars, but uh, but the, the, the biggest impression early on, other than Star Wars, would have certainly been uh, Watership Down. Which oh, was, yeah, what? Which I saw. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh no! I was, uh, so yeah, no, I was I, I was maybe uh, I don't know seven or eight when that came out, and uh, I was uh, we were in Phoenix, my, and my mom, uh, you know, I had a single mother and. My mom, a uh, single, is that right, single? I'm, I'm really tired. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anyway. It is, it is Sunday what morning I'm, here at Gen Con. What, what I'm trying to say is she was unmarried. Time. I'm not trying to say most people have lots of mothers. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't think anyone was going there. No. I don't no. think anyone was, yeah. was, was defaulting to how yeah. many sister wives did right. your mom have? No, <laughs> um, but, uh, but no, so she, 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 uh, she got together with her uh, one of her friends. Uh, I was whatever seven, and and her friend had a daughter who was maybe three, and they took oh. us to the bunny movie. Oh you no! Know? And uh, collective shock. Yeah, <laughs> you know, and we're in the bunny movie. Right? <laughs> <laughs> however, however long it's, you know, it's it bunny is, Stalingrad. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, you know, it was like however long it took until you know, there's this early on scene where uh, where poor Fiber starts having his his vision. Of like the whole world being covered in blood, you know. Yeah. And, but you know, and, and and at this, even by then, I'm already kind of like, <laughs> you know, wide eyed with 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 shock and and terror. And uh, and yeah, the little blonde headed three year old girl over 
visitor starts screaming. <laughs> and, um, and uh, yeah, they very hurriedly have to peg one more <laughs> carry us outside. And, so. Javelin toss you out of the theater. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh man, I do not think I can top that. Uh, that is a hell of an act to follow. Yeah. <laughs> um, so is the question the first film you remember first, seeing? Yeah, yeah. First film I think years. the first film I remember seeing uh, is probably uh, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, speaking of Disney. Oh. It was the James Mason. Kirk Douglas, mm-hmm. yeah. um, uh, Peter Lorre, mm-hmm. uh, uh, 20,000 when they were doing, they were doing a whole line of sort of the, with the stop motion yeah. and animation. And, yeah. yeah. And yeah. Uh, that was one of the big live action uh, uh, films. And uh, like the Tom Sawyer, the, the Don mm-hmm. Finn or Tom Sawyer as well. And, but uh, I remember seeing it in a drive in theater. Um, Very cool. That is what I remember is the, uh, and I, I particularly just have this. The only real solid memory is the uh, back of the Nautilus with its uh, big ribbons and its weird fish-like fins on it, and uh, uh, James Mason hiding against the side of the uh, the, the fin that sticks up on the back while the uh, giant squid mm. is attacking mm-hmm. the Nautilus. I remember that scene with the storm and the yep. uh, the horrible beak in it. Right. Uh, that I that I'm pretty sure is the very very first film that I ever saw. Uh, I don't remember very much more about it than that. And, Maybe the only other. So, tentacles from the get go. Yeah, <laughs> that, that, that explains a lot. What's, what's interesting, though, is like, so we are much younger than you guys. And sure. I think all of our responses to this way back when we, when we answered this were also Disney movies and mm-hmm. even people our age. So, there's something about like the timelessness of Disney, weirdly. Well, yeah. I mean, but of course, yeah. if you were to ask my kids, and they're, you know, this is 20, oh, this is 23, 24. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and, I mean, they'd probably say the same thing, right? Yes, because when they were when they were babies, that's where we started. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I, I need to throw this out, I, just because uh, my wife Jane has said in the past, I believe that she too had her first uh, movie experience at the drive-in uh, because um, it was it was where her dad could go and, and smoke the <laughs> movie. Uh, so, um, uh, and I want to say the first film she remembers seeing at the drive-in because. Just to compare uh, the parenting styles of Mr. Heidi over here uh, to uh, Charlie Brooks, uh, her dad, um, the first one she remembers seeing is the Kentucky Fried movie. Oh, oh. That, is, that is a not safe for work or children. No. <laughs> so, so, good way to segue to uh, the first bad movie you can recall seeing. You know, you know, we all we often think of movies like. Oh, that was fun. That was good. But then, some at some point, you get exposed to something that's just like, oh no, no, this is this is do not. You mean, do you mean the film that we saw? We didn't realize how bad it was at the time. Maybe? Yeah, or just like the first time you can remember seeing a movie and thinking like, yeah, oh. no, I didn't enjoy that, or or if it really kind of gut punched you, you're just like, that was bad. <laughs> like okay. the very first one that seared it into your mind. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, what about you, Mister Heavy? You got anything that? Wow, I don't know. Well, I mean. At the time, I certainly didn't enjoy Watership Down. <laughs> <laughs> that might be our first uh, dual response. <laughs> sort, of a, sort, of a, sort of a cinematic act of terror. <laughs> <laughs> um, Assault yeah. on the audience. Yeah. 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 About ten years later, right, when I was, as a teenager, I would you know, what, read the book, and I loved the novel. Mm. And, yeah. and then I could rewatch the film with, uh, <laughs> with, with uh, eyes a little more appropriate to... Uh, <laughs> what they were doing, um, and, uh, and and come to appreciate it. Uh, I would say that the the it's it's kind of well. I realize it's a bad uh, film later, but there was a time where the, the movie The Bad News Bears was playing with Walter mm-hmm. Matthau, and I guess it's the first thing Jackie Earl Haley was ever in. Oh, really? Know, the Rorschach, mm-hmm. yes, Rorschach, right. uh, isn't it playing the Juvie delinquent kid who yeah. they're trying to recruit onto their crappy baseball team. <laughs> you know, trapped on this team is me. <laughs> <laughs> and I think Tito O'Neill is in that one. Yeah. yeah. But um, uh, now that one was now that it, that film was considered a little pretty plain, a, a pretty blue, you know, because mm-hmm. Walter Matthau curses around the kids. And, you yeah. know, and, uh, and, 
that, that was the whole fun of it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah the kids little all kids, cursed and the well. kids were all smoking and chewing tobacco and cursing <laughs> at each other. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, that that sort of worked for me. That that should have been the thing that was like, okay, you're going to get away and get to do something you're not supposed to. Um, I would have been, you know, that should have been enough. But when I got to the theater with my cousin uh, Kendra, um, I decided. What I really wanted to do was sneak in and see, because I'd seen commercials for it on television, uh, The Food of the Gods, which was this 1976, so I was like, I guess it was 10. Um, 1976, Burt I. Gordon film, all right? And it was based on an old uh, H.G. Wells novel, and um, it stands out for a couple of reasons. I mean, number one, it's got uh, Ralph old actress um, uh, oh, sorry actor excuse me uh, who um, uh, had been in a lot of tough guy roles in the 50s and 60s and <laughs> I think he's in I think Ralph Meeker is in Kiss Me Deadly which is this just insane sort of private detective movie where they're, everyone's trying to get the briefcase that no one sees with it except when you open it up it glows and that's probably where Tarantino got that from seems like yeah. by yeah. the time the film is over with you're beginning to think that maybe whatever's in the briefcase is an elder god uh, that is going to be released into the world. It's it's a strange, strange horror <laughs> movie, but it also stands out uh, because it had uh, Marjo Gortner in it. Now I don't know if you know who Marjo Gortner is, but Marjo Gortner was this guy. Uh, he did some acting uh, in his career, not a ton, but he was very famous for having been in this film where Gortner had been raised in a, a, a family of evangelicals who had uh, all these sort of Carney sideshow tricks for doing cold readings and telling people about their bunions, you know. Okay. And, you know, like, like oh, I, I feel that you have uh, an affliction of the feet, you know. And they, yeah. and they would, uh, 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 you know, literally use radio sets to have guys in the crowd pick the people out and talk into them, like, oh, yeah, you've come to see the preacher and um, uh, tell me about uh, how did you get in this chair and so on. Oh, please believe me. And then they would radio in the information. Man. Well, Gortner was a was a child, eight year old, you know, scripture spouting prodigy, and did this film where he revealed all the he did this documentary where he revealed all the tricks of the trade. Mm. He had a, either falling out with his family or, or a falling out with uh, that kind of sideshow Christianity, uh, or whatever it was. But so so there's there's a, a Marjorie Gortner, uh, also famously in the horrible movie Star Crash, which. Mm. Honestly, may be the first movie I saw where even as a kid, uh, I mean, as much as I like Carolyn Monroe, the, <laughs> yeah. the, the, the revealing outfit, uh, I'm sitting there going, wow, this just will not end. <laughs> <laughs> it just keeps going. And at just the moment I think it is, it has gone as far as it can possibly go being bad. Like, nope, nope, those Italians have something else to show me that's terrible. <laughs> but it was Food of the Gods. That movie was, had, giant rats attacking people and at one point uh, Gordner has to fight off a giant rooster. Now in real life I can't think of anything scarier than a six foot rooster. Because <laughs> yeah. uh, it's just a velociraptor. Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, but they had this terrible rubber chicken head that they used for the scene which is awful looking. Um, and um, it's like my mother's worst nightmare. She grew up on a farm in Canada and was always being chased by the geese and like a rooster jumped on her head at one point. And, yeah. yeah. But the, uh, there these, it was a very, the film was very bloody. It was a very bloody exploitation film. And it was still rated PG because uh, uh, Spielberg hadn't screwed that up yet. Right. Yeah. So Red Dawn hadn't happened yet. Yeah. yeah. So um, uh, the, uh, yeah, so the, the, there are these scenes where, you know, the rats have these puppet rats heads that are always, Getting in around people, and there are these sort of faces being so these bloody faces submerging in piles of of, uh, of animatronic or puppet rat heads as they're being devoured alive. <laughs> it was just, aw- I mean, it was it was as a kid, I was just like, ah. You know? <laughs> um, I absolutely think that I have a uh, still have kind of a, a, a phobia about um, being very cat- well, rat heads. Well, no, <laughs> cat- <laughs> cat- <laughs> uh, any kind of soft. Multi yeah. two me legs, weird little front end full of uh, you know uh, uh, food grinder at the front because uh, there's a scene where a woman uh, is attacked by these these oversized grubs uh, that she gets in her kitchen and they're wrapped around the hand they're chewing on her hands oh, you know? oh, oh, and she has to you know fight. you don't see what happens exactly until you know she 
you had cut scene and you come back and our hero Gordner finds the sink full of cut up uh, worms and she's got her hands all bandaged the rest of the movie but you're like I, you you know it went down to the bone yeah, you just know right. Right? Yeah. Um, this but, explains so much <laughs> first, so much about first it. tentacles first <laughs> tentacles yeah but this uh, going back and seeing it later you're just horrified at how bad it is. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's absolutely MST3K material. It may have already been on it. Right. Uh, by now. God knows Star Crash was. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, I, I'm going to thank uh, Mr. Gordner for introducing me to these. <laughs> those, those are the two films that I could think of. Like, I didn't know one film was bad at the time. Later I realized, but yeah, Star Crash, that's some bad. That's some super bad. It's Barbarella without the dirty. <laughs> <laughs> so last but not least, uh, <laughs> what was the beer that showed you there was more to beer than... Uh, American Lager, so something other than like Bud Miller or Coors. Yeah, um, you know, I'm, honestly, I, I I've never put much uh, too much thought into into uh, into beer until um, until uh, IPAs started getting really really popular, and then everywhere I went when I ordered something, it was hoppy and gross, and I hated it. <laughs> <laughs> so then I had to kind of figure out. I feel you. I feel you on this. <laughs> I had to kind of. Feed, I, is there a way to drink this that doesn't make me, you know, uh, feel terrible? Um, and uh, so, so yes, I remember, you know, because that was a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, IPAs in general, that, that's a very good answer. I think, I, I think like, for a lot of people, that is um, their answer. Seems answer. likely. Yeah. I, I, feel, I feel like the, the, the America's love affair with IPAs, like so many Americans, out of spite. <laughs> it, it, it 100% is, because the British, they don't like their super hoppy beard, but then America's like, fuck you, we're ranking, yeah. we're wrapping up those IBUs. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and yet all the IPAs that I see, you know, half of them, the, the big ones, are, uh, they claim to be from, uh, they claim to be from Britain or from East India or something like that, mm-hmm. you know, and I don't, I mean, maybe that was the Indians way. Getting yeah, back, there's getting getting back of the empire. Yeah, yeah. there's there's this whole history about how, how IPAs came to be because they were shipping beer from uh, Britain to India, and hops keep the beer kind of fresh. So, and with all the churning of the ships and like the casks, like they got this like super hoppy beverage when they right. when they eventually uh, unloaded six months later um, in, in, in India. So that's, that's the only thing you have. So you're gonna make the best of it. Pretty much, yeah. yeah. And then come home and. Ruined, Drink your nice warm beer. Yeah. yeah. Um, for me, it was probably Moosehead beer. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, I can Canada's remember, oldest brewery. I can remember that, like back in say 1983 or 1982, uh, drinking Moosehead. Um, definitely in '84. Um, and it was, and, and I will admit that uh, I probably reached for it um, because of uh, Doug and Bob McKenzie. <laughs> just, to, just to nerd this up extra hard, you know. Um, even my beer choices were nerdy back then. I was like, "Well, I want to try a Canadian beer because they're Doug and Bob. Those two boys are date, and they're on, you know, they're on Great Night North, White North. So let's try a Canadian beer." And Moosehead was mm, better than the better than the Budweiser and better than the you know sort of the standard Miller and whatever that was being uh, shopped around at the time, you know. Um, uh, again, the uh, I always remember about uh, American beers is the one from the old Monty Python live at the Hollywood Bowl where they do the Australian uh, uh, philosophers department at the University of Old Malu and uh, the, the line was you know your American beer is like making love in a canoe it's fucking close to water <laughs> and that's that's what beer was back then mm-hmm. it was just it's an almost <laughs> almost didn't change color or flavor um during the process of right. writing it, you know, mm-hmm. uh, it, it didn't have much to offer at all, and I guess there was a there was just a wee bit more flavor to the Canadian lockers. Yeah. So, all right. So uh, we mainly uh, reached out to you guys today. So you guys are well documented as saying that you you guys were influenced by the thing because how old slash young you were when they when they came, when it came out, mm-hmm. as well as a lot of other like really good sci fi and horror and things that came out in the late 70s, early 80s, that obviously got it, made its way into uh, both Delta Green and uh, the Call of Cthulhu uh, stuff that you guys have worked on. So, but we were kind of more interested in what are maybe some, like, 
bad or schlocky stuff that you saw that you're like, I didn't enjoy this, but I liked that scene. I'm going to pull that nugget out or something kind of stuck in your mind and, um, you know, didn't make the, the list of like, oh, here's the, the Delta Green, like, source movies or uh, whatnot. So kind of just wondering maybe what were some of those kind of schlocky films. Yeah. Um, there's a couple I can think of off the top of my head uh, that definitely had influence. Um, there's a, a film called The Frozen Dead, uh, 1966. I can remember seeing that on. Uh, we had a, um, uh, a a independent television channel in the Tampa Bay, uh, St. Petersburg area of Florida uh, that we could sometimes pick up. And certainly, if we went to visit our grandparents uh, and their and their condo over in uh, St. Sorry, in Sarasota, we could pick up Channel Forty Four out of Tampa, and they had a they had they had a, a creature show for you know two movies back to back for four hours in the ad on Saturday afternoons, and it was uh, literally creature feature with your host Dr. Paul Bearer, and he would come out and he would occasionally <laughs> lip sync to um, uh, uh, oh shoot, who's the guy who did uh, Poisoning Pigeons in the Park and. See you later, mom. I'm off to drop the bomb. But uh, uh, Tom Lair, he would do he would he would do Tom Lair uh, songs on the show, um, and uh, so I saw a lot of bad uh, science fiction and horror on that. Um, I can remember seeing bits of uh, uh, the film. I was a, a teenager from outer space mm-hmm. in the fifties. Uh, where they're going to that one sort of became famous with yeah. Stephen King. <laughs> overrun the earth with lobsters. <laughs> uh, and I, I uh, one of the things I, I remember about that stuck with me is that there was this effect, uh, the, the the death ray pistol, where they you know point it and they just do a camera cut, and whatever they shot turned to bones. The first thing they do is murder a dog. Just boop, this dog skeleton just clank, you know, and it just kind of falls over. And the one that really bothered me was uh, because it was so pointless. Is one of as our aliens are trooping around looking for their buddy. They uh, they go through like a public park or something, and there's some somebody using the pool. They just kind of boop, you know, <laughs> shoot this woman uh, who's using the pool, and the skeleton, all these bones just, just sink to the bottom of the pool. And it was just really, it was really callous. It's like, you know, <laughs> well, she's seen us, you know, and that was it. And the idea that you just would reduce infinitely these bones, uh, you know, and as a kid, as a kid, you can identify them. I didn't even know you just been, and you've been not only you murdered, but you're now an anonymous murderer. That was very. I remember being really kind of creeped out by that effect. Um, that sounds like the the modern equivalent for that that you and I probably saw is Mars, Mars attacks. attacks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they first showed yeah. the gun. Like as a kid, I was like, oh, oh no! Like, <laughs> exactly. And there was a lot of that that's connected. I mean, right down to killing the dog, which is from the Mars attacks mm. cards, and yeah. uh, well, you know, it was one of the things that got the card that parents had not were about. It. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I was going to say that. Yeah. So there's this, there's this film called uh, The Frozen Dead. It's not a, a hammer film, but it's close. And the basic idea is, that, and I don't want to have Dana Andrews uh, playing a you know Mengele style Nazi doctor. And I don't even I don't even know why. I guess it's set in England. Why the Nazis are in England in the 1960s? I don't know. But it's 1960s, so you can have fresh Nazis, right? You can have guys who've been slinking around since 45. It's still a possibility. So there are these. You know, older Nazis who are trying to, uh, they've got all these Nazis that have been put into uh, cryogenics, and they're all frozen. And the idea is that they're going to try and uh, 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 wait, you know, thaw out and wake up their best people, you know, mm-hmm. and restart the Reich uh, 20 years afterwards. And um, there was a lot of creepy brain surgery where, you know, uh, the drill into the head to properly activate the brain stem or whatever. And, that keep, they, they, they fail on one of their guys and oh he's a vegetable now and like there's a there's a cellar full of uh, kind of uh, wrecked uh, moaning and groaning uh, uh, retarded Nazis mm-hmm. who've been, oh. who've, who've the, the experiments keep failing to wake them up and they're all down in the basement just, you know and uh, at some point in the movie uh, they do this thing where uh, a woman is a woman is I can't remember if she if she's killed by accident or what, but the uh, Danny Andrews is like, you know, I'm a mad scientist, I'm a Nazi, you know, 
if you want, you need extra evil science, you know, <laughs> you can go with the Nazi mad scientist. So he, he decides, Next level evil science. Yeah, he decides to, uh, I know what I'll do. I'll, I'll, I'll preserve her living brain or head or whatever, and I'll use that to reverse engineer how we're going to get wake up the rest of the Nazis, you know. I don't know why I didn't think of this before we went through five or six other Nazis, but all right. <laughs> um, presuming they started the lowest ranking one and moved up. But yeah. there's this thing where they got her head and she's got her top of her brain case off and there's a brain uh, sticking out that they're poking pins in and stuff and such. And she's, you know, this head on a table, obviously, with the action. At some point, she uses her telepathic abilities to make all the severed limbs in the uh, laboratory strangle uh, the Nazis um, <laughs> yeah, before it's over, before basically going on, you know, I'm doing the whole kill me thing when the heroes want to show up. But Frozen Dead is terrible. It's slow. <laughs> nothing happens in it. I mean, I've seen it now, and it's just, uh, it's it's not good. Uh, it goes on forever, and it's bad. Uh, and unfortunately, to continue the Nazi theme, I'd throw out uh, Shockwaves. Does anyone remember Shockwaves? Oh, Shockwaves... No. Is the very first, as far as I'm concerned, I think it may be the very first Nazi zombie film, and uh, it starts off. Uh, it, it, it has one of the greatest intros of all time for any film. If you look up the intro, the intro is available on YouTube. You might want to just play the audio for this. Shortly before the start of World War II, the German High Command began a secret investigation into the powers of the supernatural. Ancient legend told of a race of warriors who used neither weapons nor shields, and whose superhuman power came from within the earth itself. As Germany prepared for war, the SS secretly enlisted a group of scientists to create an invincible soldier. It is known that the bodies of soldiers killed in battle were returned to a secret laboratory near Koblenz, where they were used in a variety of scientific experiments. It was rumored that toward the end of the war, Allied forces met German squads that fought without weapons, killing only with their bare hands. No one knows who they were or what became of them, but one thing is certain. Of all the SS units, there was only one that the Allies never captured a single member of. It's just, it, it, it's like, you know, we got you in the first minute now. <laughs> and it's got John Carradine in it, that ancient John Carradine. It's got um, Peter Cushing. Peter Cushing oh, wow. uh, right. uh, is in it, and uh, it uh, he plays. You know, when you have the big reveal uh, that the, the 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 old man living in the mansion on this this weird mangrove swampy Florida island or Caribbean island, our, you know, the the cruise, the, six, the three hour cruise has gone awry. Yeah. <laughs> and a boatload of victims have been delivered to the island, and um, they're talking about how they were, you know hit by a ship in the middle of the night and Cushing's like what ship? We're, we're right there by the reef just, ships can't come by the reef no, they, they can't get that close to the reef and uh, they go out and um, there's this wreck on the reef that has not been there before you know, Cushing goes out and looks and is horrified and the basic idea being that um, back in 1945 he had his resuscitating casualties program mm. uh, and the Nazis had all these uh, essentially undead soldiers as they're recycling uh, guys so they could die again for the fatherland. And um, they were all, you know, you, they were just let loose on the battlefield to attack the enemy and sometimes their own men. And I, I pulled that stuff right out and put it in the, the Karateki. You know, um, uh, Cushing's men were designed to man submarines that never had to surface for air. Oh, okay. And so there's a sequence in one of the better sequences in the film is this bit where uh, all these jackboots are walking across the ocean floor, you know? Oh, that's cool. The Caribbean. And they're and they're and they're all wearing their their waterlogged Nazi uniforms. And then there's this thing where they all start surfacing out of the out of the out of the waves on the beach, coming up all these bleached, white haired, uh, kind of weirdly wrinkly, like they're yeah. they're yeah. You know, soaked up all this water, but still wearing their uh, their SS uniforms as they come marching out of the ocean and. They're kind of, sort of fast zombies. They're, huh. uh, they're, okay. they're, they're they use weapons. Uh, oh. they, they don't, uh, you know, just 
fight you. There's yeah. There's a big fighting, I remember. There's just a lot of murder. Um, <laughs> yeah, I can't remember what year it was, because uh, the, the Lucio Fulci movie, Zombie. Zombie? Yeah, yeah. They're like zombies on the they bottom of the ocean, they end up biting a shark. Oh, that's those. right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah, there is, in fact, a... Yeah, I remember that. I absolutely remember that. Um, but uh, the, 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 the undead Nazis walk in, it's from 77. Okay. So I guess it's right about the time he was doing uh, Star Wars. But yeah, uh, it was Peter Cushing, John Carradine, Rook Adams, if you can believe that nonsense. And she was about to be a relative of big star yeah. in the 70s and 80s. Um, and uh, yeah, it was, it, it was, there's been a lot of shit Nazi zombie film sets. I don't oh, much care for, correct. Uh, <laughs> was it Dead Snow or was it one? Yeah. yeah, that was the. I mean, I wanted yeah. to like it because I love the idea of, you know, uh, I, I like the concept, but I, I was too convinced that they went. You know, comedy. Yeah, it, it, yeah, it, yeah. It starts off kind of it would be scary. Alive. Yeah, and then yeah. it went. Yeah, oh, did love, you I love um, that a lot? Do you remember Overlord? Yeah, that's what I was saying. Yeah. It, you know, did you have you seen Overlord? I, it's another one I wanted to like. So, oh, did you want it? Yeah, it was not the movie I thought it was going to be. It turned mm-hmm. more like a body horror movie than like a zombie movie. I'll tell um, you. I'll tell you what's better than uh, Overlord to me. Um, there's a uh, there's a, a a very micro, very small budget film, and I believe it's called. Trench, let's see here, Trench uh, 11, there we go, uh, Trench 11, uh, it is, uh, it is the, um, the basic deal is it's the end of the war, it's all winding down, the armistice is, is either going to be signed or about to be signed or even has been signed, I'm not sure how close it is, but uh, the Germans have some laboratory uh, that they had close to the front, that, of course, uh, <laughs> that they were doing some fugly experiments in. And um, the Germans are have their mission, which is we got to destroy the place and remove all the evidence because if the Allies find out that we did this, uh, there'll be war crimes trials. Mm. So we've got to get rid of this evidence. More so, more so than you know, regular. Well, it's World War One. <laughs> oh, oh okay. it's World War One, which made it extra cool for me. Yeah, you know, it was World War One for above. And the on the other side, the Allies or or the uh, the British and the Americans are all you know. Well, and there's I don't know why they decided that they did this, but they had. Uh, American security, the, the, the trenches in the American zone, so we have to have an American escort. But the British are all about, you know, oh, we have to get the goodies from the lab, you know, long live the empire, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, that made it sound more Darth Vader-y. Than, <laughs> than, than, than <laughs> but, um, I remember him having a couple of lines like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, uh, Trench 11 is pretty good. Um, it's super low budget, but it's made by people who gave it to him. They, you can tell, like, some of the budgetary restrictions, like, when the German soldiers show up to get down into the lab and retake the lab, uh, because they only have a certain number of German World War One uniforms and only have a certain number of actors, uh, they put, there's this thing with the German that gas the, uh, uh, the, the bunker complex before they go in, and they all wear gas masks, so you can see the same actors in the same uniform about yeah. 300 times, because, you know, it's just a gas mask. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, yeah, um... And tr- uh, Trench London is a bad movie, but like, Shockwaves and Frozen Death really jump out. Horror Express. Oh, yeah. I love Horror I mean, Express. Good luck. Thanks for time. I, I, I have a painting class I have to get to. So. All right. Well, very nice to meet you both. Appreciate your time. All right. These two guys. Yeah, sorry about yeah, that. No, no, you're fine. I, I told Max on this, so yeah. I'm the odd man out here. Hi, man. See Horror Express is another one that's not Hammer, but mm-hmm. ought to be because it's it, it's, and, Yeah, yeah. yeah that's, I, I recently watched that. It was on uh, Amazon Prime. I'm like, oh, this is... This is ridiculous, but I love it. Uh, well, it's actual t- cosmic horror. Yeah, uh, uh, Telly Surveillance says, like, the... the, the well, that's the authorities. That's the yeah. perfect Call of Cthulhu moment. It's like, we should wait for the authorities to get here. And it's crazy Telly Savalas who's just randomly beating people on the train until they tell him what's going on. He just he's like, he, he doesn't even ask what's going on. Like, he just shows up. It's like, he doesn't say, how many murders have there been? And what did the brains look like? No, he just shows up and just, has, just starts beating people until he finds out what's going on. You know, and I'm like, well, great, the authorities are here. They're going to sort this all out. That's a, of course they're going to sort it out. Thank God we called the cops. Yeah. Does that make Telly Savalas? That certainly sounds like that makes Telly Savalas one of the player characters. That well, <laughs> he's the player character who shows up late to the table. Right, you're right. like, uh, oh, yeah. And you're trying to explain yeah, the game to yeah. him. He doesn't want to know about the game. He just wants to start beating people. Yeah, we'll punch yeah. someone. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so there's an old lady. I'm going to hit her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah.
Yeah, that, that, that's what happened to you last time we played, right? That, that, does, that is not completely wrong, the idea that he's a latecomer to the game. <laughs> yeah. And decided to make the game all about him. He doesn't care what's happened before. But it's all these points into a, into a, a club attack and a yeah. fist attack. <laughs> right, yeah. Exactly. Um, I mean, in a lot of, and in a lot of ways, R Express is a bad movie. Yeah, uh, and ridiculous. But I absolutely, I absolutely love it. That's it's a, yeah, it's fun. It's it's got a great concept for uh, the monster and how it works. I don't want to spoil it for people listening to this because it's it's it's, it's cosmic. Fun. It's, it's cosmic horror. It absolutely is. It is not just. But I, I sat down to watch with Blair uh, Reynolds, one of our artists, and. Um, I remember turning to him, and when you start off, and it's the frozen, reanimated uh, Australia Pythocene, you know, uh, fossil. Yeah. It's just, that's what you think the problem is at first, and it is now stalking the train, murdering people. I turned to Blur, and I'm like, you know, because he was like, oh, this is bad. This is absolutely a Call of Cthulhu scenario. Oh, it's bad. And I'm like, Blair, um, you're going to, in about 30 minutes, you're going to look back on this part of the movie where the undead uh, uh, Australopithecine Peking Man murder machine on the train. You're going to look back on this as the salad days of this movie. <laughs> it is going to go so completely off the rails and by the time it's like train heading towards cliff while zombies kill everybody and he's like yes actually you're right you got me. That was the that those were indeed the salad days of Horror Express. Yeah it's it's, so it does a lot of things really well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I think that's a great kind of segue into talking a little bit about WrestleNomicon. So our Dream Publishing and Pagan are known for Delta Green and uh, Call of Duty stuff. And can you just describe the tone of the general the stuff that you guys are known for? Well, um, I mean, I mean, Delta Green certainly is. Uh, we, we we sort of embrace the bleak in in Cosmic Cosmic Horror. Uh, we we uh, you know. We, we wanted we wanted it to be about about cosmicism as a as a genre as a as a uh, I mean it's, I think some people talk about it as a philosophy I think that might be a little too high compared to <laughs> other philosophies we're, but, just, we're just trying to scare people yes yeah. <laughs> but it's yeah. not like ooh tentacles it's more of right I yeah. mean you know there's there's certainly tentacles in some some of the some of the scenarios and some of the material but but it, but we, we uh, with Delta Green we try to make it a lot more personal and we try to make it a lot more uh, kind of existential and serious and uh, with uh, WrestleNomicon we didn't. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, could you explain what WrestleNomicon is because this game is yet to be released? Yeah yeah uh, yeah and you, and you can you can you can look it up and, and see some of the uh, see some of the some of the so, so the, the, the the arts and previews and things on WrestleNomicon.com but it's. It, uh, I mean, Russell Omicon was was me and Dennis Stetwiller like 15 years ago, just send, basically sending emails back and forth with uh, like making up making up attack moves for <laughs> great old ones out of just the stupidest puns we could make. <laughs> and um, and so so yeah, it just started and, and it started with this this giant yeah we just kind of kept kept at it and kept at it. And, so we had Cthulhu's you know, doing things like the relay shuffle and uh, you know the the uh, the uh, uh, deep one hoedown, uh, <laughs> fistful of cultists, and uh, uh, do you yeah. even God, bro? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was one of the Nair of Bill type ones. Uh-huh. You know, uh, uh, nuke to the ass, which I think we renamed for the sake of publishing the thing and uh, more of a, a potentially broader market, but. That was a that was a tough decision because we were really fond of, fond of that, and um, you know, and uh, the uh, and, and and we did a you know I started we did a Hester deck sort of uh, maintaining maintaining the uh, the tradition of conflating Hester and the King in Yellow, so we can kind of borrow from both and, uh, and uh, you know, do, uh, have things like the uh, what is it death death by a thousand artists. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and 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 my perennial favorite as I as I came up with it the completely ingenious uh, <laughs> Casilda's thong. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, that, that that that's a step beyond Casilda's thong. Yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, yeah, so the, so we so we came up with all this and. Um, and then it just sort of languished for a while. At the very beginning, we we were talking to John Koblick about uh, 
you know, we, we were thinking of doing this as a card game, we wanted to do the art, and it was like, oh, yeah, 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 and, you know, then, then, uh, and, and then we did, it just sort of sat there, because um, doing cards was really expensive at the time, and, uh, and we just didn't have enough, you know, really have the background, or feel like we had the, we had the, we had enough of a cachet in that, in that world to, uh, to make it happen, so it just kind of sat there, so we, we, we eventually got together with the, with, uh, uh, we had have, we had employed uh, Kurt Komoda, who, who's here at Gen Con um, this year with us, which has been a lot of fun. Uh, he uh, we hired him to do some uh, some art for us in uh, in Better in our, our, our role playing game Better Angels, and and it, that was really cool because Better Angels is like a, it's a super villains game, but it's also got some horror elements and some comedy elements as well. And Kurt had Kurt could really he could sort of hit all of those buttons at once in the same image, and um, and so uh, sooner or later we kind of tumbled on the on the idea of you know we ought to ask Kurt to do some of these cards. Maybe we can do something with this mm-hmm. thing at long last. Um, and sure enough, I mean the work he, he started doing on it was just ridiculously good <laughs> and funny. And uh, so yeah, so so once we we started on that, and then we spent a while. We spent a while batting around game ideas and and playing with it, and um, uh, and then and and in that process we uh, we we finally had our, our real breakthrough in game design, which is get a better game designer to do this, <laughs> and so that's that's when we uh, we got in touch with Rob Hayso with uh, and uh, his friends at Fire Opal. Rob has you know, he goes way back to he and his team go way back to magic gathering. He, he's also the designer for yeah, yeah epic spell wars and yeah, battle wizards yeah yeah so you know he's got the chops for that kind of thing um and so so rob rob and his people did the uh, did the did the game the, the game mechanics for it and he you know he thought it was just a hilarious mm-hmm. idea too so um so yeah so what we wound up with was this uh, this really this really interesting fun game that kind of on the one hand it's just these hilarious cards and the uh and uh, uh, but uh, and, and and so as you play it, you know, uh, uh, it, uh, on the surface level, like if you're if you're playing it and you're drinking a lot of brews, then you can just enjoy the goofy cards and not worry about it. But if you're a more serious, like you know, the, the, the strategy is your thing. Um, the way that they built the game, uh, there's 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 some kind of layers to uh, to the tactics and the strategy of it. So it's got a little bit of it's got a, it's got a pretty good good amount of uh, Replay depth into it, which yeah, is, which was interesting to find. I remember, um, I think it was last year. I was demoing it with you, and you know, it's it's set up as like a one on one combat kind of game, and it really mm-hmm. captures like the flow of like a fighting video game because you can like set up combos and you can like interrupt them and stuff like that. So right, right. you know, and, and I think it's the closest at least I've played that something that kind of captures that back and forth kind of feel. Like you know, and it's it's pretty easy to like learn how to play it, like, you know, fighting is like, oh, yes, I push this button to punch, right. this button to kick, but then it's like, oh, no, I, you know, do this little sequence or whatever, then yeah. just like, I, how did that happen, so, <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. Um, yeah, so WrestleNomicon is, uh, it, it's coming together now, we've got, we, we had a, we ran a Kickstarter for it, you know, which did, did well enough to, to fund manufacturing and, and pay, uh, you know, pay, uh, pay, pay a, a fair advance to, uh, to Kurt for the, for all the artwork that he did. Essentially on spec, uh, quite a while ago, and uh, and to uh, to Rob and his team. So, so we're getting the last thing we did. We did get John back, John Pavlik back in to do a couple of bonus cards. Um, since we made these original plans fifteen years ago, he's <laughs> since gone on to become very busy. <laughs> so, um, but uh, but but he was very he was very gracious to uh, to agree to let us track them down last year at Gen Con. So okay <laughs> and and you had Kurt do some of your art for your uh, D&D adventures that yeah, you guys mm-hmm. have been refining recently yeah yeah Kurt, Kurt has Kurt has proved uh, has proved so flexible and reliable that we're you know we, we, we've essentially planning to exploit him for oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, 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 yeah we, we've essentially told him we will we will uh, we will keep paying him for work until he cries uncle um, and uh, yeah so so I did I started these D&D adventures uh, in the the lie is called Swords and Sorcerers, which is, and it's 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 fifth edition. But I went into it kind of 
wanting to basically wanting to kind of play with uh, uh, play with the way fifth edition works and the way adventures work in fifth edition D and D uh, and experiment with it. And and uh, there 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 are some ways that uh, like I don't want to get too too much into the weeds on the way fifth edition works, but fifth edition is kind of built to facilitate giving players plenty of resources to sort of rejuvenate their characters. It, it's built It's built to be kind of resource heavy. So if you want to play a game where the characters don't have to worry about much beyond just it's time for a fight, mm-hmm. you can play it that way, and that's, that's the way it's built. Uh, and at the same time, it, it, you know, fifth, uh, fifth edition, like every other edition, Dungeons & Dragons is the first one, has, you know, it kind of leans into the, uh, the, uh, the the assumptions of the world of Dungeons and Dragons, which is very kind of you know it's forgotten realms and shit. It's kind of and uh, and I wanted to kind of depart from both of those standards and make the make adventures that uh, that that challenge the players and that um, and that challenge the characters and and made the resources harder. And also, I wanted to make the uh, make these make sort of discrete standalone episodic adventures so you could have the I wanted to have the sort of this feel of the swords and sorcery fiction that I loved so much as a kid mm-hmm. you know the, the short story collections with, with, but for, for Elric and Conan and Fox and Grey Mouser um, where it wasn't about this kind of epic high like, adventure three volume mm-hmm. saga of a continuing well, thing it's, it's it was, far more proletarian uh, was, at least Conan and, and uh, yeah. the Grey Mouser are you're not getting the view Right, 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 right. You know, yeah, like yeah. you had told him. Mm. Uh, you know, it's all, it's these guys who, you know, uh, you know that, that chamber pot right there in the room. Right? Oh, yeah, yeah, no, and that, and that's what, and, and that's how I that's how I play these at home, right? I, yeah. I mean, on my home game, I, I sort of, I tweak the downtime rules a little bit as well um, and, and essentially require the, uh, the, the player characters to pay for their living expenses either by working between adventures or from the gold that they, you know, that they earned in, in their previous adventure. And so every adventure we want, you know, they, they, they uh, you, you know, if they do really well, they collect a lot of treasure, you know, and every adventure is basically about, okay, the adventurers have heard there's all this loot in this temple that's been abandoned, so they have to find it and deal with the locals and confirm is it really abandoned. <laughs> Either get permission or trick them into to it to letting them find. Yeah, <laughs> spoilers then, probably not. And then yeah, yeah, and then uh, but then in, in my campaign certainly like every, every new adventure kind of starts off with the with the characters having burnt through almost all of the gold that they found <laughs> or you know that they were so proud of. Um, and uh, and you know and I love I love doing that and making that a part of you know a part of the uh, the challenge. And yeah. So anyway, so it's and and setting wise, I also wanted. Explore a setting that felt different. Oh yeah, and, and from from Kurt's art, you definitely yeah. get that. Just from um, like the cover of your second adventure has someone riding a zebra being attacked by a furry velociraptor. Yeah, um, and that just, bright, brightly that, colored velociraptor. Brightly colored velociraptor. Yeah, yeah. and uh, just some of the uh, characters that Kurt has done art for. I'm like, wow, that is that's something I hadn't seen before, yeah, or, yeah. or so far departing from what you think of when you think of. Uh, Dungeons and Dragons or dwarves or stuff like that. So. Right. Yeah. No. I, I mean, I I I've built them to be very easy to just pick up because they're episodic. It's really easy to just pick up one of these adventures and put it in some blank spot on the map of any world that you're playing in, and just say, okay, this particular corner of the of of the world we're in uh, is a little exotic, and you know, and then if you want to go back to you know, water deep or whatever, then that's you know. So that's up to you, um, but uh, but yeah, and so that's so I'm sort of the, the the visually culturally I'm kind of drawing from drawing a bit I'm drawing I'm, I'm kind of drawing a setting that's from to make it feel way older you know my touchstones instead of on this are more like you know, Iron Age you know, oh, okay. like seventh seventh century BC as opposed to the Middle Ages, um, and so that uh, and that goes a long way toward making sort of look and feel interesting and fresh, right? Because most D&D players certainly don't have, I mean, most of them, some of them, a lot of them do, it's D&D, most of us are history nerds too, but um, you don't usually associate, you know, rolling the D20s and playing your barbarian, you know, or your, your wizard or whatever, with um, with all of the sort of trappings of antiquity. So 
so bringing that into it, uh, I feel like helps helps it helps it stay kind of fresh and helps and uh, and also helps kind of justify the the the, the challenges that I'm trying to inflict on the players. Anyway, it's been a really fun project, and yeah, Kurt's Kurt's illustrations on it just phenomenal, just phenomenal. He's, it's just, it's astonishing how uh, how good he is, um, and especially in just in the research you know he's really really great at, you know i'll tell I'll, I'll, i will send him a well, we're doing this character portrait but uh but what my vision for for this character this pre-gen is that she's a ranger but she's a sailor so what i want to what i'm going for is like say uh you know like uh, early uh, early iron age um you know t- uh, tire you know like the, the the levantine she should look kind of middle eastern but the but the clothing doesn't need you know i don't want it to look hellenic or you know, I would give him these really specific things, and then say, and then get creative, <laughs> and um, and you know, he would send it a sketch. I'm like, done, perfect. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> also, you read my mind. There were three other things I forgot to tell you. And <laughs> there <they> are. <laughs> All right. Uh, I think that's just a great way to end this. Um, again, Shane Ivy from Art Dream. Thank you for uh, taking some time to uh, sit down with us. Thank you. Um, thank you again for giving me a badge. Uh, <laughs> well, well, thanks for running games for us. Yep. That's a tremendous, tremendous... Max enjoys running games. I, I do enjoy running games very much. <laughs> very great. much, yes. And uh, Scott from Bacon Publishing, thanks for thanks for giving us a history of bad film. Kind of. <laughs> 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 looking dirty. Uh, right. It is difficult to shut me up. Uh, yeah, yeah, but it's, it's, put a nickel in me. Yeah, I will tell you all the things you didn't want to know. Yeah, you, you sit on one of uh, your games. It's like I have a minor in this now. Um, but but yeah, so uh, good brief bad view. Signing off, John Con. As always, please watch and drink responsibly. <laughs> Goodbye. Bye.